With that, um, let's get underway here. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, thank you for taking some time here this, this Friday afternoon um, to have a discussion on a topic that really doesn't need much of an introduction. Um, we have three uh, distinguished panelists here who will be uh, you know, having a good conversation with um, on the scripted part for about 40 minutes, and then we'll open it up to uh, Q and A um, from the audience uh, for the last 20 minutes. And you can, of course, just submit your question um, in the chat box there. And uh, rest assured, this will be archived. So uh, I'm sure as we get into some of the denser pieces of this, some of you may want to go back and play back a few things. Uh, that opportunity uh, will be there um, uh, for, for all of you. And uh, with that, uh, let's go ahead and dig in. So of course, this, this issue is something that's been grabbing all the headlines here, um, rightfully so, uh, for, for the last couple of weeks. Um, and it's important to note that we, we frame today's discussion around uh, cold weather and the grid, um, making note that this isn't just a Texas issue. Um, it's important to recall that what we saw uh, last week, uh, we saw over 100,000 customers in, in states um, without power ranging from Oregon to Virginia. And of course, we saw um, the grid operators, uh, three of them in particular, had to institute rolling blackouts. Um, in fact, SPP, which covers the Great Plains, uh, instituted its first rolling blackouts ever. Uh, MISO, which covers the Midwest and part of the South, uh, had to do it for the second time in six months. And then, of course, Texas had to do it as well. And in Texas, we saw a lot more sustained outages, not just the, of the rolling variety, um, which has really contributed to a, a much stronger conversation um, in that jurisdiction. Um, but of course, the conversation on who's responsible, what policy responses may be appropriate, and what we've done over the last decade in particular on cold weather readiness stretches everything from, from federal entities to state entities. And so we really wanted to bring in folks that had the, a great blend of background, um, some with skin in the game, some with a great independent set of expertise to really provide an overview to um, provide some clear narrative on what we know based on the evidence that does exist but also recognizing that the book is still, the jury is very much out on many elements of this, right? Something like um, the data on what caused power plant outages typically takes two months <laughs> to come fully out. And in this case, we may have greater access to it sooner, but in many regards, we can't jump to some conclusions yet. And of course, this day and age, um, you know, hearings have already started, um, investigations have already been launched at the state and federal level. So there's a big need to start framing this discussion productively now. And um, with that, um, I, I will introduce our panelists and we'll dig right in. So uh, in no particular order here, I'll, I'll start off with Beth Garza. Uh, Beth is a senior fellow with us here at R Street. Uh, she joined last August. And prior to that, uh, she served as the director as for the independent market monitor for ERCOT. Of course, ERCOT is the Texas system that has uh, attracted the most scrutiny to date here. Uh, so welcome, Beth. And next, I'll introduce uh, Commissioner Cheryl LaFleur, who uh, was a long-serving commissioner and, and oftentimes chairman of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, or FERC. Um, Cheryl's background is unique also in that in many ways, uh, we in the industry came to know her as the reliability commissioner because she had a lot of interface with the North American Electric Reliability Corporation, or NERC. And we'll get into the FERC and NERC space, uh, especially with her insight here in just a few minutes. And then um, we have uh, Todd Snitzler, who's the president and CEO of the Electric Power Supply Association, or EPSA. Um, I'll also note that Todd was the former chairman of the Public Utilities Commission of Ohio. And among other things, part of his engagements while in that role were to interface with FERC and other federal stakeholders on talking about elements that get into fuel security and cold weather preparedness. So overall, we have a really great set of folks to dig into these issues. And with that, um, let's dig in. So first off, going across the board here for all of our speakers, at this stage, what do we know? And almost just as importantly, what do we not know? Let's start with Beth and then go to Cheryl and then Todd, please. Okay. So I think what we know, as I would describe it, we, we know that uh, during the starting on uh, from the 15th, the early morning of February 15th through the 19th, uh, we had an electricity 
crisis, I would say. Um, that then turned into, in the state of Texas, a water crisis for the next few days. And frankly, at this week, I, I, I hesitate to use the word crisis, but uh, invoices are coming due and the financial strain and limits are, uh, are being, at ERCOT are being uh, felt and, um, and attempted to be managed. Um, I think that will be, you know, there's sort of, <laughs> we've already dropped two shoes. Uh, the third shoe <laughs> to drop is the financial out outfall or the outcome of this, uh, of this situation. So, um, so we know we had power limitations that led to water in, in limitations. We're in the middle of figuring out what the financial implications are um, in terms of just details and uh, the best way to describe it as my personal situation. I live here in Austin, Texas. Um, I was part of the initial uh, curtailment that was supposed to roll that didn't roll. Um, my power went out about two o'clock Monday morning. Um, being the electricity nerd I am, I was up and could see with public information that things were, were getting very tight. And, um, and then so I was not surprised when my lights went out and, and under, I understood what was happening. That's very different, you know, I understand that that's, uh, you know, a fraction, a small, very small fraction of the population. And that's also uh, uh, one of the challenges that, that we're dealing with now is just that communication. Um, I was out for 80 hours and uh, it got very cold in my house. Um, and, but I had the fortune, for, good fortune of continuing to have water, continuing to have natural gas, and those are the things, those aspects allowed uh, things to continue. Um, the damage that has been done is, is still being counted up. And uh, certainly in the state, we're looking at damages as large as any kind of significant hurricane that would come through. And those damages are being felt statewide. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there and we can get into more details later. Thank you. Well, thanks, Devin. Thank you for having me. If you had said two weeks ago, one item you worked on in your nine years at FERC is gonna be all you talk about for days on end. I would not have guessed the 2011 cold weather outage investigation report, but that is where we are. Um, I think Beth did a good job of explaining what we know. We know from everything ERCOT has released, you know, the timing and scope of the outages, the type of generation that was involved. Um, what we don't yet know is the detailed plant by plant data of why each plant tripped offline and where in the electric or gas system the problem originated. And we don't have all the forensics on the, either the wholesale or the retail market of you know, where the money was flowing at any given time. And of course, we're gonna need to do that complete analysis. But I think the biggest thing we don't yet know, and we're probably not gonna know until the dust settles, is what action should be taken to make sure this doesn't happen again, either in Texas or anywhere else. And there's so many different parts of the puzzle and we have a very disaggregated system with a lot of different agencies looking at it. I mean, as I know, we'll get into FERC and NERC looking at weatherization and reliability standards. Um, the Texas legislature or the PUC looking at wholesale market issues, retail market and contracting issues, which they already opened a docket on potentially transmission planning and operations. The distribution companies clearly have to look at distribution operations, how they did their feeder roll, how they did their feeder rolling, how they sectionalized their loads. The Texas Railroad Commission, I'm sure will look at gas supply issues and there's probably more than that. So there's a lot of, there's a whole potpourri of alphabet agencies now hovering and we need to do a complete analysis to figure out what are the most important steps that can be taken there or elsewhere. Thank you, Todd. Thanks, Devin, and thanks for uh, inviting us to participate. So uh, I think first and foremost, if nothing else, the last two weeks have really shined a very bright light, no pun intended, on the importance of a reliable electric system. And we take it for granted so often that when there is a situation like this, it's brought into very sharp focus just how dependent we are upon the system. 
And so, of course, we represent many of the independent power producers around the country. We don't do a lot of work in ERCOT because, of course, the Texas market isn't FERC jurisdictional, but our members have a lot of resources there. And I think, first and foremost, we want to extend our heartfelt sympathy to the impacts of people in Texas. Uh, it is clear that there were mistakes made, that there are changes that are needed to be had. Uh, in order to make sure that something like this doesn't happen again. And our members are committed to finding the right next steps in order to achieve those better outcomes than we've had. I think Cheryl really hit the nail on the head when she said there are a, a litany of agencies that have some responsibility, some of which are the usual suspects that you would expect to have uh, jurisdiction in this event. But I think you've also seen where there's been an even tighter integration between the natural gas system from wellhead to delivery to the city gate to the electric system. And that was an area that was identified as early as 2011 when Cheryl did that great work uh, with the original, well, I guess the most recent cold snap. And now we've seen an even greater integration. And so I think the evaluation and the investigation that needs to be done to arrive at a root cause analysis for how we got to where we ended up is going to include some players that perhaps weren't as involved in previous iterations. Uh, and I think any root cause analysis that really provides value and leads to solutions is going to need to look a little more broadly through the entire energy value chain. Um, and it, it goes from, you know, the, from the production field all the way to the light switch and all of the parties that are responsible for delivery, production, regulation uh, are, are all going to have to take a look in the mirror and really have some accountability about where the mistakes were made, where decisions that could have been done better need to be looked at in order to prevent this from happening in the future. So I know we're going to dig into some specifics, but I think that's really kind of the primary takeaway is that this is a this was a human tragedy that we need to make sure we're looking at how we can prevent it from happening again. And it's a systemic, holistic approach that's needed, not simply a, an exercise in finger pointing or assigning blame. Well said, Todd. And I'll, on your point on the, the systemic element here, I thought uh, Commissioner Clements over at FERC had a good statement uh, a couple of days ago in the, in the press where uh, we saw a lot of uh, initial responses from FERC commissioners overall say, let's pump the, the brakes on blaming this resource or that technology or any of that stuff. Let's start talking about a systemic analysis of what happened here, because ultimately this is about a portfolio performance. Uh, as we'll see uh, in a few minutes here, that, that gets into some very specific policy tool implications, correct? Absolutely. And so with uh, digging into some of the details now, Beth, um, just a targeted question for you here. Um, we already have, of course, uh, ERCOT providing testimony this week legislatively. Um, we know that investigations will get into not just ERCOT, but SPP and MISO and some of the decisions that those grid operators made. So mm -hmm. walk us through real quick, what's the process that grid operators go through when generation becomes scarce as demand rises? And more importantly, how do we fairly evaluate the grid operators and the rest of the market participants during these types of conditions? That's a great question, and and part of the you know part of the the the, the aura around this event certainly is this is some discussion about well Texas you're an island and if you had been connected this would be better um, it would have been different I you know I'll I'll leave uh, res uh, I'll reserve judgment on better or worse I, it would be different and part of that interconnect the separate interconnection of Texas creates a different or a little different focus in how operations are managed here in Texas versus the Eastern or Western interconnect. And what I mean by that is we are, the Texas grid is very frequency focused and frequency 60 Hertz is a is it's not, it, it is not technically precise for me to use it this way. So if you're a, if you're an electrical engineer, uh, you know, just ho hold on, bear with me. But that 60 Hertz frequency is, is a good metric for how closely demand and supply are matching up. And as you all know, electricity it, with very limited capabilities cannot be stored, right? And so it, demand and supply have to match every second all the time. And to the extent it doesn't, frequency here in Texas is what sags. 
frequency will drop if demand exceeds supply. And so the, 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 that's what ERCOT operators are very keyed off of and the actions are taken to protect that. Now, why is that? Well, you know, this 60 Hertz alternating current system that we all take for granted. Um, it, and and a, a little digression here, as somebody who's been in this industry for a very long time and talks about at high levels, uh, you know, demand, supply, price, this, that, when we get into these kinds of situations, I am continually amazed at the fact that electricity is a phenomena and the, and the details on which and the and almost miraculous way in which it is produced and managed and, and, and that we take it for granted so easily. Sorry, that's my own digression there. Um, what happened as temperature, very cold temperatures uh, descended, if you will, and I say descended because they come from the north and move their way south. As they descended through Texas, really, we started with some freezing precipitation on Thursday night, um, cold weather moving in Friday, Saturday, Sunday evening, we served the record, ERCOT generation served record peak demand at, uh, yeah, seven o'clock on Sunday evening. And that record peak demand was 69.2 gigawatts. Um, not quite a summer peak, but a very high winter demand. As evening went on, as we went on from seven o'clock, load continued to want to arrive. <laughs> you know, generally you would think, oh, people are going to bed, lights are turning off, things will, things will tail off. No, the demand for electricity was staying very, very high at that point. And what was happening is generators were tripping offline and you saw frequency drop because of that. Um, very quickly, right around midnight, um, you know, the pre-emergency things were taken, you know, actions were taken, uh, advisories, warnings, uh, 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 some of our responsive reserve was deployed that is turned into energy to try to help with, with uh, emergency conditions. At 12.15, we were in level one, in 12, at 1.07, we were in level two, and at 1.20, we were in level three and initiated uh, uh, firm load shed. I'm going to say it that way instead of rolling outages. Mm -hmm. Firm load shed at 1.20 in the morning. Um, that first drop was, um, that was dropped in a couple of different slugs, if you will and uh, over several minutes and as what we saw and this is the details that'll have to be worked out but between like 1 20 and two o'clock in the morning we saw loads being dropped which will rise frequency then we then we saw generators dropping which will sag frequency and you you see that tension between each other we heard conflicting testimony yesterday at the uh, at the Capitol, where you had generator owners saying, "My generation tripped off because of frequency excursions, or because of low frequency," and ERCOT saying, "We did not see that data." So there's clearly there's clearly you know two different people are saying two different things because they haven't gotten in the same room yet and and looked at a consistent set of data that has to get sorted out and, and understood. So the situation between, you know, 120 and two in the morning got very dire, frequency got very low, um, and then, you know, more load shed, more load shed. Um, in a course of a very short time, we ended up with over 10 gigawatts of load shed in like a half an hour period. Um, to put it in context, Back in 2011, our last kind of winter event and the last time we had firm load shed, um, the, the magnitude there was four gigawatts, which represented about seven to eight percent of demand. Ultimately, in this event, as much as 20 gigawatts of demand was curtailed, that that's by my measure close to 30 Three zero percent of demand was curtailed in this event. So the just the order of magnitude of the actions required 
certainly larger than we've ever seen, ever had to deal with. And that had, you know, downstream effects, long-term downstream, long-term meaning, you know, days instead of hours um, effects. Um, I'll stop there and see if there's anything else you want me to, to cover. Sure. I think we'll, we'll circle back on a couple points here if we have time on that. Um, I think that's a great distinguishing point though between like the, the firm load shed that ERCOT had to pursue in that context as opposed to what we saw in some adjacent re regions, but also even compared to other situations like what Texas had to do in 2011 or what a CAISO out west had to do last summer. Um, and so I think that's, that's very interesting. And um, as we get into the common thread of understanding these different types of reliability events and their classification, I want to point a, a question over to Cheryl, because a lot of times, whether it's this event or what we've seen with, with past events where we've had um, rolling curtailments, <laughs> as Beth would prefer to say, um, we've seen a lot of confusion, especially when it comes to who's responsible for making sure there's sufficient generation on a system. There's been a lot of confusion about which entities are responsible for what rules that affect that. Um, and we've, uh, so maybe if you could provide a, a quick bit of insight on what's, what's FERC's role in that conversation? What's NERC? What are the grid operators or, or RTOs like ERCOT, CAISO, SPP, MISO? And then what are states responsible for uh, knowing full well that it varies sometimes based on the state context. But if you could provide a, a, a bit overview of that and what some of the tools are that these different institutions use uh, to ensure the lights stay on. Okay, wow. <laughs> um, first of all, resource adequacy, as I'm sure we have a very informed audience here, um, is really adequacy of resources, having enough power plants or other resources to keep the lights on. And it's done differently in different regions of the country. Um, the three Eastern ISO RTOs, PJM, ISO New England, and New York ISO are all in regions where in large measure, the states deregulated the generation market and they rely on merchant generation. And those markets run mandatory forward capacity markets to make sure they're gonna have enough resources whose rules are very closely overseen by FERC. ERCOT, which of course is not regulated by FERC because it's within its own interconnection, also deregulated generation, but has relied on an energy only market with scarcity pricing to make sure there's enough resources. MISO and the mid-continent ISO and the California ISO have hybrid systems, mostly with state responsibility um, that the state regulators oversee the electric companies making sure there's enough resources, but they have um, wholesale market backup overseen by FERC. Um, SPP has markets, energy markets overseen by FERC, but for resource adequacy, it's strictly vertical integration. And like the bilateral market regions of the country, the state regulators really make sure there's enough resources. I just want to say that the, the rolling outages the, in California last summer, which were, of course, considerably smaller than the Texas outages in both time duration and geographic scope were in my view, a resource adequacy event. At least for that time, California didn't have enough resources. I don't believe what happened in Texas was a resource adequacy event. Texas had plenty of power plants. They had plenty of steel in the ground. It was an energy security or energy adequacy event where they had the resources, but they didn't, they couldn't produce energy at that moment. And I actually think energy security is gonna be an increasing issue in the future as we use, a, use the balancing resources, the fossil fuel resources differently um, to balance the um, variable renewables. So overlaying all, if you want me to keep going on NERC, overlaying all of that, um, that's all like the markets and how you pay for resources. NERC is uh, the so-called electric reliability organization, the North American Electric Reliability Corporation. And they have in place a set of mandatory standards for how the bulk electric system, basically 100 kV and up operates. Not so much do you have enough power plants per se, but they look at transmission planning. What's your plan if you lose your biggest resource? What's your plan if you lose your second biggest resource? How do you set your relays? How do you trim your trees? as well as hostile threats like cybersecurity and physical security. 
And it's a kind of a funky system because NERC used to be voluntary and just a bunch of voluntary standards that the gentlemen engineers worked on until the 2003 blackout. Um, Congress made it mandatory. Now there's now the standards are approved by FERC and there's heavy penalties if you violate them. And the, the oddity in this particular circumstance is even though FERC has no electric oversight into ERCOT, they do have reliability oversight into ERCOT, into making sure that they follow the reliability standards. Um, and that's the hook for the both the 2001 and the current FERC investigation. And I'll, I'll stop there unless you want me to keep going. Well, I think that's great. And I imagine we may get into another question about how these different reliability entities with different responsibilities develop different tools to address some similar and, and in some cases the same problem. Well, they're all uh, trying to work on the same thing, which is making sure there's enough reliability to serve the public. Right, right. And, and Cheryl brought up the point of uh, the status of uh, power generation uh, regulation, which varies by state. And I think that's a great, you know, Kind of segue over to Todd here, whose members are those competitive power generators. And that decision making model, both on the investment side as well as the operating side, um, has a totally different set of incentives and decision making process really for the power plant owner than those that are on that traditional cost of service regulation, where every action really is just overseen by the state PUC and who, who gauges whether the utility gets cost recovery for that. So Todd, my question to you is, how are decisions made differently between you know, competitive versus cost of service generators and how does that kind of have implications for power plant reliability? Yeah, that's a great question. And I'll try to wear both my current hat and my former hat as a regulator about how these decisions are made. But you know, the cost of service model, as you rightly note, says that the utility makes what it believes are prudent investments in order to ensure that they can operate their resources when they're called upon to do so. And they go to the commissions to seek recovery for those just and reasonable expenses. The commission either approves or disallows with an appropriate rate of return. And so there's every incentive for integrated utilities to make sure that they can make their units run. Uh, they get paid when they invest in their equipment. So they, of course, are always happy to do that because that ensures uh, a longer term rate of return for them, which is the, what's their business model. That's, that's how it works. In a competitive generator model, you've got a different set of incentives. Um, our members and other competitive generators have every incentive to ensure that their resources can operate when called upon, because if they don't run when they're called, they don't get paid. Uh, and the bulk of their revenue comes from the energy market. Yes, there's a capacity portion, of course, depending on the market that you're in, uh, that supplements that revenue and ancillary services as well. But the bulk of the revenue comes from energy. And so those owners are obligated to make sure that their plants can operate when called upon. And so they make the decisions as they look at how the plants are going to be used. What type are they? Are they a traditional baseload, which is an overused term that I, I don't like to use, but I will for this instance, or are they peaking units or are they storage? Are they intermittent? Are they, um, what's the nature of that resource? And then how will it likely be used? And so those investment decisions are made. So it is incumbent upon a competitive generation owner to make smart investments to ensure that their resources can operate. If they fail to do so, and they have a capacity obligation, they either one, have to buy out their position, which costs them the revenue that they otherwise would have earned as an energy generating resource, or they find themselves in a penalty position where they are penalized for not performing as they contractually agreed that they would do. And that's also a bad outcome. So it's, they have every incentive to ensure that they are investing dollars in plants so that they can operate when called upon, so that they can both retain the capacity revenues that they may have already uh, been awarded, but also to secure the energy revenue when that resource is needed to ensure that the grid can remain reliable and in balance. And so it's two different approaches on how investments are made. I think the, the big distinction is our members and other independent power producers get paid when they run. So they have every incentive to ensure that the plants can operate when called upon. And a regulated utility has a bit of a backstop in that they have captive customers that will pay whatever the commission deems to have been a prudently incurred expense. And so they are, can be a little more agnostic about whether they run or not, where our members' resources simply have to be in a position to run when they're called upon because that's how they get paid. 
And that's that's a great point to make. And, and I'll transition this uh, thought over to Beth now, because a lot of the concern that happens when you have these scarcity conditions, whether they result in events like this or just near misses, is that prices go up. And naturally, there's a, a lot of uh, political tension when prices go up in a wholesale market. But of course, as Todd alluded to, in a competitive context, prices are extremely important signals that motivate reliability. So Beth, my question to you is, what is the, could you elaborate on the importance of price signals during these scarcity conditions, but then also address the question of what protections are in place to avoid the exercise of market power and any manipulation abuses? Yeah, and, and then if I if you'll indulge me, I want to step even further back, and you know we've talked about deregulation, deregulating the generator segment, and why do we do that? It you know it wasn't just a, a you know oh this is a great idea we'll do it. We did that to shift the focus and shift the risk to competitive entities instead of the old regulated days where all risks of generation, you know, nuclear cost overruns and power plants, you know, inoperability, all of that risk was borne by utility customers. So the era of deregulating the generation 20 years ago was intended to shift that risk to, you know, competitive suppliers and allow the forces of competition to drive appropriate investment. And, and, and so that's why we have these markets. And, and as Cheryl mentioned, you know, the market in our kind is different than many others. And that it's different from the fact that we do not pay for installed capacity. Um, the only time generators in ERCOT are paid are when they are generating. And the price that they can be paid is allowed to rise to very high levels. It's allowed to rise to $9,000. And that why $9,000? Why not five hundred or five million? $9,000 was, was intentionally selected and deemed by the State Public Utility Commission as the value that of lost load. That is the value that customers in aggregate would be willing to pay to maintain electricity. So it wasn't made up, it was a very intentional value. That $9,000 value drives investment decisions. It, it, you know, it's intended to provide incentives to bring generation. Similarly, as prices rise, it's incented to uh, drive down demand, drive down consumption by those customers who may not want to pay that much, who may be exposed to those kinds of values and don't want to pay that much. In terms of, of you know, uh, accusations of, of price gouging and whatever, um, you know, one of the very important components of all of these wholesale markets is a market monitor who is whose job it is to ensure that there is no market manipulation, that generators, for example, aren't trying to artificially withhold generation in order to jack up the price. Um, that's a very important and very key function of, of the market monitor and why they are included in each of these markets. The other super important part I want to say on this that has gotten zero airplay. So, uh, you know, I know there's some reporters on this, on this, uh, on this webinar now. This has gotten no coverage, the fact that, it, so not, yes, we allow $9,000 pricing. We also have a circuit breaker. There was, there is a circuit breaker built into the ERCOT wholesale market because after four days of $9,000 pricing, you're not incenting anybody to do anything. And, and we recognize the fact that after a certain period of time or above a certain level, those high prices are not are no longer uh, appropriate for the incentive, that it's appropriate to drop that offer cap. That mechanism was suspended by the PUC on Monday for a very good reason, and part of it was super high natural gas prices. So yes, there is a circuit breaker. It was suspended. It, it the nature and design of that circuit breaker absolutely has to be on the table. 
other markets that have energy only and allow prices to, to rise to very uh, high levels. The, the chief example of that is the Australian market. They have a very, um, a much easier circuit breaker, if you will, a much easier to understand circuit breaker. And so that style may be something that uh, is implemented at, at, after, uh, out of this, but allowing prices to rise is important for the incentives, at some point, it's it's just um, uh, you're just allowing too many dollars to flow out, and that it is important to have that circuit breaker. And in this case, our circuit breaker did not work. Yeah, and I'm sure that's going to be a great topic to to kind of distill down to a takeaway here and, and steer into next steps and everything. Um, I'm going to skip ahead to the last question here, which is for all of you, and we'll we'll start with Cheryl. Um, right now, right, investigations are underway, both the detailed ones that get into the forensics, um, as well as the ones that are um, as, as much high level theater as they are um, getting into the, a, a lot of the, the, the dense subject matter area. So in a couple minutes, um, I'd like to know what your key takeaways are for legislatures, uh, both at the state level and Congress, and then how do we best set up these state and federal regulatory investigations uh, to, to make sure we have the most productive next steps in this? Sure. All right. Well, I mean, I think all the people involved in this drama are human beings and they have commercial interests. And I mean, well, first of all, the customers are human beings who are the ones who were enduring the human tragedy but the people whose job it was to keep the lights on in some way, shape or form or regulate those are also human beings. And unfortunately, we are um, have been in the stage of a lot of hot takes and um, biased confirmation of what people already thought about their own set of resources or somebody else's and unfortunately some political finger pointing. And I think we need to move past that to the actual analysis. And my own view is that while the people who keep the lights on in Texas and run the market are gonna be a very critical part of that analysis, we also need independent thought um, as potentially as happened in the 2003 blackout where the DOE set up a, a study panel or um, other independent thought to come in and kind of take a look of all the various manifestations of this. I think we've already seen some of the analysis started. FERC opened a docket with NERC pretty promptly on looking at reliability standards implications. I don't think I covered this when you asked me before, but in 2011, FERC did, a, did have a complete investigation of what happened in that coal snap and um, made a number of recommendations, including a standard that would require, a reliability standard that would require weatherization um, which never happened. Uh, they worked on it for a couple of years and then dropped the standard, the SAR, standards authorization request was voted down um, at the NERC level. And it was turned into a voluntary system of weatherization audited by ERCOT. Um, FERC also made a number of other recommendations on Black Start and so forth. Um, at that time, FERC, FERC has the authority under the Federal Power Act to order a standard to be prepared. They had never done it in 2011, um, but then they did do it. We did do it on in 2014 on the physical security standard, on the geomagnetic disturbance, on supply chain issues. So I would not be surprised to see FERC be a little bit more muscular this time and require a reliability standard. And I would be very surprised if that standard were just for Texas. It really should be a standard for generator owners and transmission owners throughout the North American bulk electric system to look at their vulnerabilities, particularly in an age of climate adaptation and so many more severe weather events. I think beyond that, we'll probably see investigations at the state level that need to take a clear eye look at this. And um, I think it's important, that, as I started with, that we move past the politics and really look at it because there's a lot to learn, not just for Texas, but for everyone. As I've said a couple of times, this is no place for anyone who has anything to do with keeping the lights on. As a regulator, as an independent system operator, as an electric company, whenever something happens somewhere else, it's no time for shot of foot. 
schadenfreude, it's time to say, okay, what are my vulnerabilities? What are my blind spots? How do we learn from this? Thanks, that's really insightful. Um, Todd, what would you be your, your takeaways for um, both the, the legislative um, focus right now, as well as the more detailed regulatory uh, inquiries? Yeah, uh, allow me to follow up on Cheryl's great comments. I, I think she is spot on. I think cooler heads will arrive at better decisions. Uh, clearly, and perhaps justifiably so, uh, there is a lot of outrage at the situation. Uh, and I understand as a former legislator, as well as a former regulator, your constituents expect you to represent and advocate for their interests. And so the political class needs to do what they need to do as well. My caution would be two things. First, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, take your time, get it right, as opposed to do the wrong thing, but do it quickly. That's perhaps not as politically um, expedient or as thoughtful as what quick action might look like, but it could lead to very bad outcomes. And so whether it's Texas or other jurisdictions, uh, even all the way to Washington, I think a slower, more thoughtful, fact-based analysis will arrive with better policy solutions. And so I think that probably ought to be job one. I think secondly, there are those who are already criticizing market-based or competitive environments as saying this is, the, this is what, what you get in a competitive environment. And I think that's fundamentally flawed. I think in many ways that bathwater and baby analogy continues uh, to be, needs to be thought about from the competitive market perspective. As Beth noted, risk has been shifted off of consumers and on to those best able to bear that risk, the investors or shareholders of the entities that own many of these assets and resources. I think you also have to look at how they're protecting consumers. Uh, the, the headlines are shocking when you look at what the potential residential bill increases could be. But almost all, and I don't know the exact percentage, so I'll, I'll be vague, but almost all of the retail customers in Texas are on a fixed price contract. And so they are not exposed to the vagaries of $9,000 price caps. In fact, the risk is shifted on their supplier. And so the supplier is the one bearing that risk and bearing the cost. And there's been at least one publicly traded company that's had to announce that they've had a billion dollar hit as a result of bearing some of those costs. And so I think throwing away the benefits that competition has provided is a mistake and that that some might feel like the reflexive, easy thing to do. Well, if we'd have just done it the old way, it would have worked better. Well, I think there's evidence to show even from this storm uh, that if you look at vertically integrated markets in states that are more traditionally regulated, they had many of the same, if not all of the same issues that the competitive market had. And so I think simply oversimplifying your analysis to say, well, if we'd only done it the other way, we did, we'd have landed in a better place, it probably doesn't get us where we need to be. So that would be my second piece of advice. And that goes all the way from all of the states that will inevitably look at the situation in their jurisdiction, state PUCs or PSCs who may decide to investigate as well, all the way to members of Congress who feel obligated to do something to ensure that this doesn't happen again in the future. I think they need to look at the successes that have occurred and look where the mistakes that were made and make corrections, not wholesale changes that would undermine the value that's been developed over the last 20 years. Those are all great points. Thanks very much, Todd. And I think one interesting nugget too here is that we've seen a lot of peer reviewed literature on forced average rates um, among generators, but that's typically going back many years, right? And we saw as soon as they went into competitive hands, right, we started to see forced outage rates go down and also planned outages for, for maintenance. Because again, if you're not making, um, the way you make money is by being available. So the profit motive is actually aligned with reliable performance there, which has very you know, sizable implications. It will be interesting to see if we open the book on some research here to see what's been happening in the last couple of years. And I know that um, Beth has some insights on how uh, you know, some of the Texas fleet has performed um, in response to price signals, not, not so much last week, of course, but in recent years. Um, and maybe Beth, we can roll this into your takeaways um, uh, for, for all the, the next steps going on right now. So, yes, uh, and I guess, the, you know, to that end, I would just remind everyone that Texas is a very summer focused market summer focused operations, summer focused market. Um, and things like outage rates and, uh, you know, as we, as 
installed reserve margins in ERCOT have declined over the last few years, what we saw was an increased availability of power plants during those peak periods. And, and that goes to, you know, I'm only getting paid if I'm available when I think I'm needed most. And that's the alignment of incentives that the energy only market provides. Um, this, but the summer focus of our system is, is also a weakness. You know, we have, you know, we have large demand side um, programs and resources. What, what are the bulk of them? The bulk of them are air conditioning interruptions or it's summer peak focused programs of limited, if any, it, you know, I've limited, if any help during this situation. And, and that's why I, you know, getting sort of the, the cross country version, um, you know, so for Cheryl and the ISO New England thinking, you know, that it's for them, it's a winter storm. They deal with it all the time. What's the problem? So then, let me, so I would toss to her, all right, so what if it were 110 in Boston for a week? What would break there, right? At verse, and, and conversely, it was below freezing here in Austin for a week. Lots of things broke here. We'd never really thought of it that way. And so getting, you know, understanding those kinds of um, exposures is, is going to be super important going forward. Um, it's definitely not a hot take and it's hard work and it requires uh, coordination and communication amongst entities that, you know, maybe not always are coordinating and communicating. So. That's my takeaway. Perfect. Thank you. Um, I'll turn over to our questions here, and we have plenty of them. <laughs> None of them are quite simple, I have to say. So I'm going you know, to just go ahead and paraphrase a few of these. Um, one of the first ones that came in, um, I think, might be a, a pretty quick one to react. And I think that was pointed at you, Beth, where we were talking about um, a question about like the frequency on the system. And as it started dropping to 59.4, 0.3, and so on, what are those implications and how close um, was the system to a worse event? And what would have the implications of that worse event have been? You know, we've, we we're talking about last week as a crisis. Um, we were, pro, you know, ERCOT is, is publicly stated and I have no reason to, to disagree with them. And based on the data, I would agree. Data they prevented, I, would, I think it supports their position. We were probably four minutes, four minutes away from not just crisis, but, you know, a, apocalyptic outcomes. Um, and what does that look like? That is a full widespread blackout of the ERCOT system. And you'd have to go back to 2003 in the Eastern regions where you had, you know, kind of a full wide scale blackout. And it took days to recover from that, but you still had some, you had some interconnections to be able to bring you back. Or cut without those interconnections, it is super hard and super complicated for us to try to do that. It's never been done, and there are those that say that it may be impossible to do. So as much as as much pain and suffering and crisis, if, if you will, that that we we suffered last week, we were very very close to. Um, you know, and when I say nothing would have worked, there would have been no electricity anywhere, no cell phone coverage, no nothing. Um, it's a scary situation, scary part to be, but that's why we have trained operators who take those important and decisive and, and in the end painful actions for many people to prevent that from happening. And that's why we invest them with that power and authority is to protect all of us. Um, if I haven't mentioned it, I, I, let me say it now, lots of specific and good detail available from, is available from ERCOT at their website, ERCOT.com, uh, under the board meeting that was held on Wednesday, February 24th. There's a good slide deck that has lots of, of the, this round or this initial round information for anyone who, who hasn't found it yet. Absolutely. That's, that's a great point. And it also shows just, you know, raises a lot of questions about just how prepared we would have been for the near miss that was a much worse event. And for that, there's, there's a great question in here, um, talking about the, the role of a retrospective review 
um, that also gets into um, the, the, the quality of the governmental response um, in terms of handling relief. And I know that a lot of this starts getting out outside of our electricity policy domain, but I, I can't help but bring it up because um, a lot of the work that was done um, on grid resilience when this got brought up a few years ago was also recognizing that many events and events of this scale or system black events um, anywhere in our system are, are a potential outcome on, for a variety of causes. It could be a massive earthquake or severe weather or a physical or cyber attack or what have you. And so a lot of the recognition, you know, in crisis response here is to say, you know, never again, we'll never let um, these types of, you know, supply resources ever go out again. Well, we have to also recognize that honestly, there will be circumstances where we're always going to face severe exposure going forward. And I know Cheryl, there was a lot of commentary going back a few years on, on resilience and, and having that element of it. But I'd be curious to get any of your responses um, it could be black start capability to bring the system back online or anything else about like how we also need to think about the resilience of the system to bounce back to what's inevitably going to be um, some, some challenging events that could spring up for a variety of reasons. Well, I, I definitely think that all aspects of the response should ultimately be examined. It's mm -hmm. logical to start with the power plant performance and the wholesale market and then go to the retail market and so forth. But I mean, Texas has actually a lot of good experience with emergency response and hurricanes. And but however, the emergency response happens should be post mortemed. One thing I think that we really need to think about is how the distribution companies handle the load shed. Uh, I used to run a distribution company and we had our feeder books and we had our load shed plans and we knew where our trauma hospitals were in our community hospitals and our nursing homes and our water pumping stations. Um, and it's hard in the moment to do everything right. But I think uh, a lot of pain and suffering could have been relieved if they sectionalized and kept some of the water pumping stations on the way they kept the hospitals on. Um, and that's easy to say after the fact, but those are the sort of lessons to be learned. I think one of the things we got a very poignant reminder of is the interdependency of all these networks and the loss of water was a huge factor here and a big cost driver. So I think every part of it has to be unpacked because, you know, they say never waste a good, never let a good crisis go to waste. There's a lot we can learn. And I mean, our feeder books, I'm sure they're online now because this was, at, you know, an earlier era, but I mean, they, we drill them every year. That doesn't mean we would have been ready to have rolling blackouts and execute them flawlessly. It's very hard. Well, and another, I'm gonna glom onto that if I could, because that I this is a super important part too. It, it, basically the curtailments required were so large that the distribution uh, companies were unable to find other places to curtail. Because it, it, now with better sectionalization, I gotta believe that would have been possible. The other thing that has come out is the updates of where these quote critical loads are, but was probably hadn't been updated in 10 years the last time we went through. And certainly the gas folks are, are hollering that, you know, we could have delivered if we'd had electricity, you cut off our electricity. Um, I, the, the, so that coordination and communication and identifying uh, each of those and then having a more flexible distribution system that is, is not just because, you know, Cheryl, uh, you and me, I had responsibilities for this at, at one point as well. And yeah, it was literally a book. Um, frankly, I, my guess is they've taken the book and they've put it into a computer spreadsheet, but the, you know, any kind of updated or automatic or technology driven way to try to, um, um, uh, manipulate or sectionalize the system has those investments I I would challenge uh, have not been where they could or should be and really are just technology <laughs> at this point. Um, sure if you said to the customers in Texas, um, we'll make sure the water stays on and you can each have power four hours a day until we come back on, they would have that would have been preferable to what happened. But you know, that's easy to say that has to be planned in advance. You exactly, you exactly. And I, you know, if there's a good thing that can come out of this, it would be a focus on that aspect of the system and the 
basically all, reliability all the way down to the consumer level uh, would be allowed and enabled. Um, that would be a good thing that could come out of this, I think. And the only thing I'll add to that is, I, and Beth, I think you mentioned it, and I think Cheryl, you mentioned it as well, is looking at what is defined as the critical infrastructure. What, what are the things that need to stay on? For example, a compressor station that is now run with electricity that's going to keep gas flowing probably ought to be classified as something that is critical and needs to remain on because it delivers both natural gas to homes and residences, which is for health and human safety, but also for the power plants that had low pressure issues. And so thinking through things that, again, recognize the greater integration of the electric and gas system that, you know, it, it existed in 2011. It's only been enhanced since then. It's a way for us to try to avoid some of the problems. It's part of the testimony last night that I heard uh, from the Texas Senate talked about the fact that some of the um, gas processing facilities lost power. And if you can't process your gas and take out the liquids and the other things that are not going to go into your dry gas system, you're not going to have gas to deliver. And so that that seems almost obvious in hindsight. But on February 9th, I don't think that was the top of mind for anyone. And so I think having this long, more detailed, deep dive diagnosis about what we did well and what needs to be improved, corrected, or changed will help prevent some of these things from being repeated in the future because it's simply not acceptable for it to happen a second time. I, I, on, that, on that line, I'll throw out another tidbit I wrote down. CenterPoint said that uh, going into the outage, they had 32 uh, identified critical sites. And during the course of the, of the week, um, that number rose to 130. Um, so, I, you know, and that was a lot of what the PUC chair and the uh, Railroad Commission chair were working on in a collaborative way to, you know, hey, I don't have any electricity, we're, you know, and, and doing that on an ad hoc basis. Doing it during the crisis is not the most effective way. Developing a single map in time, not the most effective way, because I think that's what happened post-2011. So then we got to figure out how do we do this systemically? When you're connect, you know, when the distribution company is connecting to connecting something that looks like a gas compressor, that should set a flag at that point, right? All of those kinds of systemic changes are are what I would hope that we're focused on. After sort of, you know, well, we did a whole flurry of activity ten years ago. Let's not do the same flurry of activity. Let's try to figure out how to make systemic improvements that will allow. A, allow those integrated systems to both be more reliable going forward. Absolutely. The, the emphasis here on the demand side is so big. And what we see, of course, in most of the media articles is just what supply wasn't available. Um, many of us in the reliability policy domain have been talking about the need to start differentiating um, firm demand <laughs> into subcategories of, of critical or to, um, I think the point Cheryl was making, uh, the duration of curtailment matters very, very much for a lot of end uses too. Um, we didn't have the technology in the past to do a very surgical job of a lot of this, we now do. Um, and in many cases, like in Texas, you have uh, these advanced metering infrastructure that's laid out. But um, perhaps that's a great conversation for another dialogue, uh, especially a lot of that gets into distribution level policy um, and even some distributed resources and like you know physical backups in critical areas. Um, but we are just at about our time here. Um, so I, I, I do want to really um, just thank everyone for, for, for chiming in here. Um, this is an extremely important topic. I feel like you all could have <laughs> gone off on this for a few days, right? Um, but to that last point, um, you know, Todd I, 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 and, and, and Beth, a couple of your points there on the water system and the gas system. Um, interdependencies. This is something that we've made progress on overall as an industry. And obviously there's a, a lot <laughs> to go. Um, and of course, Cheryl oversaw a, a, a chunk of that um, over the last decade, but really getting those, those system interdependencies better mapped out uh, and more rigorous is going to be huge going forward. Um, so thanks again for all your insights on that front. Um, and we will um, look forward to continuing a productive dialogue on this issue for the, in the weeks and months to come. Thanks, Devin. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Devin. Thank you. Have a great week.